In this video, we're going to talk about fluids in motion. We're going to work with ideal fluids in this class. So they are incompressible. They, we're going to only look, think about laminar flow. So there's no swirling. Everything's just going in a straight line. And we're going to also assume that our fluids are non-viscous. So they're frictionless. So you think about like trying to pour honey out of a bear, a plastic bear. Honey is pretty viscous. So it's, it takes a long time to drip to the bottom of the bear or the top of the bear's head and then you have to squeeze it pretty hard to get it out. We're going to assume that there is no viscosity in the flow of our fluids. So this is a uh, this is the model that we're using. Now we need to consider the equation of continuity and this one you should have derived in the lab by now. We I'm going to derive it for you with equations here as well. So if I have a tube that constricts. So here it is uh, at a large diameter and then it constricts to a small diameter. We know that since the fluid is incompressible, the amount of the volume of fluid that comes through this part of the of the tube every second has to be the same as the volume coming through this tube because the, the mo molecules are not getting bunched up. They're not spreading apart. So if we start with uh, volume one is equal to volume two, and then we know that our volume is our delta L times that area. Right here, and area is that whole circle. I'm not sure why it's giving me the eraser sign today. Um, and then, oh, sorry, I did that part too early. And then, so this is delta L1 and A1, and this is delta L2 and A2. So volume one equals volume two. If we divide both sides by T, then I can just regroup. Um, and if I regroup this delta L1 by T, that gives me a change in position over a change in time, which is a velocity. So I get velocity one times A1 equals velocity two times A2. So this is an important equation to be able to derive and understand and use is the equation of continuity. We're going to go through the derivation of Bernoulli's equation. Um, it is basically a conservation of energy statement, and I'm going to derive that with you. I have, I have it all worked out already so that you don't have to watch me um, write all the, <laughs> sometimes it gets a little tedious to write the long equations. So here's the situation we have. We have a tube with a given diameter and there's fluid flowing through this tube. Then the tube goes up, so its position in the gravitational field is changing, and the tube constricts. So there's going to be a velocity of the fluid coming in, velocity of the fluid coming out. Each fluid has a y value, a position in the gravitational field. Each tube has an area measurement. Each tube has a pressure at these different points and let's apply conservation of energy. So um, we know that the fluid to the left in the pipe does work on um, the plane A1, right? So there's this plane, you can think of this plane of fluid molecules, and there's fluid just outside that plane that's pushing that fluid to the right. So we know that work is equal to force times distance, so force times delta L1, and that's equal to force is pressure times area. So pressure one times area one times delta L1. That's the work done on that fluid. Now the fluid to the right of the plane, so if we're talking about this blue um, fluid is what we're thinking about, pushes to the left of the fluid doing negative work on the fluid. So we can apply the same thing here. Work is uh, we put the negative sign in since it's negative work. It's pushing the opposite direction of motion. The force times the distance, so delta L2, which is this right here, um, right here, up here, delta L2. And um, that's equal to pressure times area because force is pressure times area times delta L2. Now work is done, also done by gravity on the fluid because the fluid is raising in the gravitational field, so the fluid is going up, but it's being pulled down, the work done by gravity is equal to 
uh, negative because it's negative work. The force, which is mg, so the mass of the fluid times the gravitational field strength, times the change in position in the gravitational field. So y2 minus y1. And then I just distributed our negative sign and got this, negative mgy2 plus mgy1. Now I know that my total work done on all of the fluid is the work done by the left plus the work done by the right plus the work done by gravity. So I put all those together and I get, um, this is my work done from the left, this is my work done from the right, and this is my work done by gravity. Now we know that work is equal to change in kinetic energy, that's the work energy principle. Um, and so the work done from the left side and the right side, and then the work done by gravity, those are going to result in changes in kinetic energy. So we are going to put in here 1 half mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. That's our change in kinetic energy. And then we're going to, we have this nice big equation. Um, so this is basically change in kinetic energy equals the total work. Now we're going to apply the equation of continuity. So in the equation of continuity, we know area 1 is equal to delta L times delta L1 is equal to area 2 times delta L2. We also know that mass is equal to density times volume. So um, if we plug in, we're getting a statement for mass, actually, basically. So our mass is equal to our density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid, which is A1 times delta L1, and that's equal to density times A1 times delta L2. Now I'm going to plug those mass statements in for my mass right here, and right here, and right here, and right here. And I get this amazing long statement. So let me keep this in view so that you can see it all. So um, here is what I get when I plug in density times area times delta L, which is just density times volume, for all of my masses in my energy statement. And we know that A1 times delta L1 equals A2 times delta L2, and that statement is in every one of these terms. So we can cancel out all those things in red. And what's left is 1 half times the density of the fluid times velocity 2 squared, minus 1 half times density of fluid, of fluid times velocity 1 squared equals pressure 1 minus pressure 2 minus density times g times y2 plus density times g times y1. Now we usually rearrange it so that we have all the 1s on one side and all the 2s on the other side. So we can see that we have pressure. Uh, this is our pressure statement. This is our basically kinetic energy. This is our gravitational and potential energy. Here's pressure, which comes from the work, is equal to x, the kinetic energy part, and the gravitational potential energy part. So you can apply this equation to any moving fluids. Um, if it's a, and we'll go through the different pieces, but that's the derivation, and you can see how it just comes from conservation of energy. Okay, so um, one way that I like to describe Bernoulli's effect uh, is, well, let's talk about Bernoulli's effect first. Uh, pressure is higher at a point along a streamline where the fluid is moving slower, and the lower where the fluid is moving faster. I'll say that again because the bell rang. Where fluid is moving slower, the pressure is higher, and when the fluid, fluid is moving faster, the pressure is lower. So that's something that you really need to make sure that you um, know quite well. And it's a little bit like traffic on a highway, I think. So um, if we have, let's think about it, um, let's think about it that way. I'll explain that in just a second. Um, so we have, I have Bernoulli's equation printed out for you. Um, and then basically we think about how these things are changing as we go, um, like as we change the area, so the diameter here, as we change the gravitation, the place in the gravitational field, um, the velocity of the fluid will change. So if you think about pressure as in terms of like traffic, 
So if the pressure is higher, then the vehicles are going to move more slowly. Um, if the pressure is lower, so traffic is less, the vehicles will move faster, the particles will move faster. Let's apply this a couple of different ways. So one way that we can apply this is um, to think about a large tank of water. And that large tank of water has a spigot in the bottom. So we're going to actually treat this um, kind of, we're going to have a special statement here uh, when we treat this. And that is because this tank is so big that if you're looking at the velocity of a particle on the top here, on the surface, it's basically zero because the, the level of this water is changing so slowly. So you can, for point two here, you can just say that that's zero. And then um, you have the velocity also, sorry, um, we also assume that it's air pressure at both the, the surfaces because here we have an open spigot and here we have an open tank. So those um, cancel out because they are both air pressure. They're the same. And so you're going to use Bernoulli's equation. You start with the whole thing every time, and then you apply the specifics to the situation. So here, um, all we care about in this situation is the velocity at point one, the, and then the change in position in the gravitational field, basically, um, between point one and two. So uh, when we put this all together and then solve for velocity at point one, we get the square root of 2g times the change in y. Does this look familiar? It should, because if I, if I apply kinematics, um, I have initial velocity is zero, so that goes away. I use uh, this equation and solve for final velocity, I get the square root of 2g delta y. So that's really cool that Bernoulli's equation gives us the same thing. This water is moving sideways at the same speed that it would be if it was just dropped vertically, uh, which I think is really neat. Let's look at another situation. Let's say that the fluid flows horizontally. Well, if it flows horizontally, y1 and y2 equal each other. So those pieces cancel, and this is the equation that you would use. Um, cool. So um, what does this, OK, yeah, I missed this question. I just skipped right over it. What does this equation tell us about the fluids that don't change height? So fluids that don't change height, if we have a lower velocity, we're going to have a higher pressure. And if we have a higher velocity, we're going to have a lower pressure. And this has a lot of really cool applications. And we'll talk more about this. Um, specifically, we'll do some demonstrations. But uh, like airplane wings, so the shape of an airplane wing allows it to fly in the air. Uh, it has a longer upper surface and a shorter bottom surface. So these air particles are split by the air and the particles that go over the top of the air have to, or airplane have to travel faster than the particles that go below the airplane. So since they're going faster, they have a lower pressure, causing a lift, causing more pressure on the bottom of the airplane wing than the top of the airplane wing, and causing uh, that upward pressure. That's the only one I'm going to, oh, I'm going to explain this one as well. Um, so we also have a baseball uh, curve ball. Um, this explains this as well. So let's say that we have this baseball and it's thrown towards home plate and the pitcher puts a curve on it. So they're, they actually put a spin on the ball. So the way they release it from their hand causes it to spin. Well, as it's spinning, it's kind of like dragging the air along with it. It has those little uh, stitches and so it drags the air along with it and on this side, we have that air that's dragged coming, going this way, but then it's like rushing through the air, which is the opposite way. So you're basically subtracting those um, and you end up with lower speed. And then uh, here, 
the air is pulled along with the baseball and then it's also rushing through the air so that results in faster air and a lower pressure. So the curve ball will curve to the left because there's a lower pressure on the left side than on the right side. Um, obviously not doing those. I think we're going to stop there and